Has he been faithful all your life? Do you ever doubt his faithfulness? Do you ever have a moment where you doubted God's faithfulness? Yeah, if we're honest, right? If we're honest with ourselves, if uh, when, you know, we have those moments in life where, my goodness, Lord, where are you in this? Where are you in this? How could you let this happen when maybe a child is in the hospital? You question, Lord, how could this happen when, you know, we were praying for Callista just uh, over a week, little over a week ago. She was in the hospital, two-year-old little girl, intubated. Where are you at, Lord? Where are you at in this? And I'm um, just so glad to, you know, hear that she's home, right? She's doing well. Yeah, I hear there's quite a testimony behind that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, God was faithful, wasn't he? He's always faithful, you know, but we ask, why? How, how could this be happening to us? But in the midst of it, God is always faithful. When you get through it, you're like, why did I even question? Why did I even ask? You know, God is always faithful. Praise God. And um, I'm grateful. I think uh, Amber mentioned the drums. She was grateful for the drums. We do have a drum set now. It was donated last week by the Mendoza family. And we're, um, I appreciate it. Yeah, very nice. We're working to tone it down a little bit so it's not too loud for this room and um, trying to and working on the drummers to tone it down a little bit so we don't blow you out of the room. Jesse did a wonderful job this morning playing it lightly so you know so it wasn't too loud and uh, just so appreciate it. I think it does add another dimension to our to the music ministry here. Um, praise God for that. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We're going to Finish looking at Stephen's defense this morning. It, not so much of a defense, is it, as an explanation. You know, he's not defending himself. He's explaining to the religious leaders what they should already know. That if they would just take a second look at the scriptures, at their history, they would see that really they're the ones doing exactly what they're accusing Stephen of doing. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about just this morning how we have a chapter and a half almost of, of, this, of Stephen's defense, his explanation, going through the Old Testament scriptures that were very familiar to them, you know, the stories, and really to us as well, right? Why, so why did he give a, such a long discourse on this? When I think about Peter, when Peter was preaching, Luke said, and with many other words, Peter went on to share about Jesus, and, and he doesn't give it to us. And, and here we have all this full, Luke gives us the full explanation, and there must be a reason behind it. He's telling them stories that they know very well. However, he's telling them from a different perspective. He's telling them from the perspective of knowing Jesus now, and he's trying to get them to see Jesus in the stories that they've always known so well, trying to get them to see it from a different perspective, to open their eyes to what they've always known, but to see it in a different light. Do you remember when you were blind, where you couldn't see, and then God opened your eyes and you began to understand the scriptures in a different light through the eyes of Jesus? The Jewish leaders, now, or now Stephen, full of the Spirit, sees Jesus in the stories. You ever try to read the Bible before you were saved? It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. You get saved, you become full of the Holy Spirit, and, and now you see it. Now begins. Now you see Jesus even when you read the Old Testament. And that's what he's trying to do here. The Jewish leaders are fighting to protect their customs, their traditions, what, you know, what they've always done. They're trying to protect their power, their authority, and, and, they're not, and their eyes are closed to see Jesus in the stories. They're spirit, in other words, they're spiritually blind. They're blind, you know, spiritually blind. Look what Jesus said of them in Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and the blind leads, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. He's using a metaphor. They were spiritually blind, yet trying to lead others, acting as blind guides. To be spiritually blind is to not see Jesus. You just can't see Jesus. He's all around us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, right? He always was. He always has been. Everything, everything in all of creation is pointing to Jesus, yet we're spiritually blind if we can't see Him. 
Jesus was right there with them. Everything about him said that he was the Messiah. His whole story, his whole life, his, the, every, everything about him, his ministry, the miracles, said that he is the Messiah. But they couldn't see him. Some could see him. Some could see him. John saw him, right? This is the Lamb of God. You know, some the, the, the apostles saw him, but some but why couldn't but others couldn't see him? Why can some people see Jesus and others not see Jesus? You saw Jesus, right? How come you t- you ever try to talk to somebody about Jesus and they just can't see him? They just can't see him. Why is that? Have you ever tried to tell someone about Jesus and they want to know about the People in Africa who never get a chance to hear the gospel. It's like, you know, Rachel was trying to tell somebody about Jesus the other day, and she said they just wanted to know about the people in Africa who, can't, who, who never hear the gospel. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> so what do you do? You, you tell them, you know, like if you can answer that question, they're going to see Jesus. You answer that question, guess what? They're going to have another question. And then if you answer that question, they're going to have another question until you run out of answers. And then when they finally come up with a question that you can't answer, see, told you there was no God, told you there was no Jesus. They'll just keep going. They, why is that? No, the truth is they don't want to see Jesus. You're trying to tell them about Jesus. You're trying to get them to open their eyes when the reality is the fact is that they just don't want to see Jesus. They've rejected God because, you know, they're not interested in God because God always reveals himself to those who have a heart to see him, for those who want to see him. There was something that came into your heart at some point in time and you wanted to see Jesus. And guess what? He was right there waiting for you, wasn't he? He was right there waiting for you. God always responds to those who seek him. Jeremiah 29 12 and 13 says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me or search for me with your whole heart. If you have a heart to search for God, guess what? It's a promise. You will find him. He's not going to hide from you. If your heart is inclined to God, he will be there waiting for you. Acts 17:27. 17:27. Love this scripture, this whole story, but so that they should seek the Lord. This is why we were born. This is what Paul's explaining to the people in Athens. What is our whole purpose in life? So that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. If we have a heart just to reach, it's a picture of him, of us reaching out with our hands spiritually, his hand is right there to meet us. He's not far if we have a heart, to op- if our eyes are open to seek him, we will find him. We see a great example of this in Acts 10 when Cornelius, a God-fearing man. Remember Cornelius, a Gentile, and, and didn't, wasn't the gospel always to go to the Gentiles? Yet the Jews weren't bringing it, the, depo- the apostles weren't bringing it to the Gentiles. Yet here you have a God-fearing Gentile seeking God with his heart his whole heart, and he wants to know more about God. And because nobody went to him, God gave him a vision. God gave him a vision, and God gave Peter a vision and sent Peter to him. What a great example that, you know, God will reveal himself to any heart that's seeking. So what about the person in Africa who has never heard the gospel that has a heart to, to know God? God will find a way. Listen, we all have an eternal witness within us that there is a God. God created something in us because we were created in his image that we want to know about him. Whether we know about him or not, we're always looking for God. God, if we have a heart to want to know God, God will reveal himself, you know, to us. The issue's always the heart. A heart that seeks will find God. So we see Stephen's heart. We see Stephen's heart here, a zealous heart we talked about a few weeks ago, to heart to, to serve and to preach the gospel, to, to tell all who would come, who would listen about this God that he has found, about the Messiah that he has found. That was his heart. Today, we're going to see the heart of the men Stephen stands before giving an answer for the hope 
that he has. Where is their heart? They know the same scriptures. And he, so starting back in, we'll back up a little bit to verse 35. We, we're, we finished in 37 last week. It says, This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So Stephen's reminding them that they had a bad history of rejecting the deliverers that God has sent them. They've always done it. Look at your history. We remember he went back to Abraham and Joseph and, and then and Moses. And they've always had this. They always rejected the deliverers. They rejected Moses the first time, just as they're rejecting Jesus the first time. We talked about that last week. Remember, Moses came back after 40 years in the desert, and then they, you know, through the signs and the wonders, they, they, they allowed, they welcomed him, received him as their deliverer. Well, in the same way, they rejected Jesus the first time and they're still rejecting Jesus. But when Jesus comes back the second time, when he comes back the second time and, and they go through the tribulation and they go through, guess what? They're going to see Jesus. They're going to see Jesus. Multitudes of Jewish people will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this same time, this time, just or just as Jesus is, Jesus is a prophet like Moses, he'll lead his people out of spiritual bondage. You know, Moses said himself a greater prophet would come, one that they should listen to, that they will hear if they open their eyes, if they open their ears. And Jesus also performed wonders and signs. So verse you know, 37, this is that Moses said the children, said to the, who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise for Raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. They reject, who rejected and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out before the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. He is saying, Can you see that you're following the same pattern? You're following the same pattern as your forefathers, as your ancestors did. They rejected Moses. They rejected the prophets. They were and, and, and made idols out of them, you know, out of things. And you're following the same pattern that you've always followed, that your people have always followed. You made an idol out of the temple, out of the law. You've made them an idol. And I picture Stephen pointing to the temple, the work of your own hands. Look at the temple. You're worshiping the temple. Remember, Stephen was charged with blaspheming the temple. It wasn't the temple Stephen spoke against. It was the way they worshipped the temple instead of worshipping the God of the temple. They made the temple their idol. And just as Israel worshipped the calf in the wilderness, he goes on, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. The host of heaven refers to the sun, the moon, the stars. You know, they worshiped, you know, the universe. There's a, and there's a point in their turning from God, that God gives them up. God gives them up. Not, not gives up on them. God gives them up, gives them over. There's a point, you know, where God gives us over to what we want. If that's what you want, go at it. Have at it. This is what you want out of your, you want to worship idols? You want to have your own way? Have, your, have at it. Go do it. You know, Paul said the same thing in Romans 124, he said, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their body 
among themselves. What happened, you know, they wanted to be, to be sinful. They wanted to dishonor God and dishonor the, go have at it. And, and where does it lead to? Well, you don't have to look no further than America or, or the state of our world today, do you, to see where it leads to? You know, homosexuality and, and abortion and, and the decimation of marriage and, and all the things that we're seeing today. You think God has given us over to what we want? And he always does it for a reason. He doesn't give up on us. He gives us over that we would come to our senses, that as we live in the consequences of our sin, as we dishonor our bodies, we realize that, man, this isn't right. This isn't working. This isn't natural. This isn't normal. Hopefully, you know, we come to our senses in this nation and realize this isn't right. And we've come to a place of repentance and, and, and our hearts are set again towards God. And guess what? God will be right there with his hand. I'll I hope the church, I pray that the church is ready to receive. A, a needy world when they begin to repent. And we don't just, not a pointing finger, but an outstretched hand. That's what the world needs. And that's why God gave them over. That's why God has given us over. They worshiped Moloch. Who was Moloch? Moloch was the God of prosperity and success. Oh boy. He was the God whom the parents would offer their firstborn children to watch them die believing their families would be more prosperous and their businesses would be more successful as a result. Pretty horrible, isn't it? Moloch still worshipped today by many and even in America. We might not have call him the same name, but, you know, hey, we'll, we'll abort the baby so we can have more success and prosperity. We don't have time for children. I'm not ready for a child. I have a life to live, a business to run. And, and we see that all the time, don't we? The star of your God, Rempham, an idol to a star, probably Saturn. They didn't distinguish between stars and planets when Amos wrote this. This is a quote from Amos 5.26. He said, if it's idols you want, you want to worship idols, I'll give you idols. And I'll, I'll give you idols. I'll send you to Babylon where idolatry is flourishing. Plenty of idols there for you to worship. And he sent them to Babylon for 70 years. They lived in, but they would live in Babylon where they became so sick of idolatry, so tired of idolatry that even today, even today, devout Jews want nothing to do with any sort of idolatry. They got tired of idolatry. God will give you what you want and see how you like it. Do you like Chinese food? It's good for a while, right? But then you get sick of it, don't you? I get sick of it anyway. <laughs> well, if America doesn't find favor with God again, or if Jesus t doesn't come back, we might be eating a lot of Chinese food. <laughs> our our great-grandchildren might be speaking Chinese. Listen, God, if America doesn't righten the ship and turn back to God, don't think he's going to let us keep killing babies. Don't let us think he's going to keep desecrating the institution of marriage the way he created it. Don't think he's going to let us continue running amok in our sin without judging this nation, just like he judged the nation of Israel over and over again and sent them into captivity. And hey, they, they, guess what they did when Babylon? They began to learn the Babylonian language. They began to eat the Babylonian food, right? Their cult, their culture, they got ingrained. Hey, who's our greatest threat right now? I don't know. Maybe it's China. Maybe it's Russia. Who knows? Who knows? God will raise up an army to come in and invade our nation and take take and take our nation and who know you know is it possible is it biblical i believe it is for a nation that doesn't repent that continues to go the way of the devil God will come in. He will step in. And guess what? We get to be a part of that. Hey, just because you may not be part of it, you're not part, if you're not part of the solution, we're, we get to suffer. Not all the people that went to Babylon were worshiping idols. Daniel, Shadmat, Daniel and, his, and his friends were at least four of them that, that did not bow down right, to worship of Baal or anybody else. Yet they had to suffer for Daniel spent his whole life, most of his life in Babylon. So we are not exempt from it. So if we become China, do we still call it Chinese food? No, it's just food, right? No, the point is, it's a, a nation. We have to see where we're at and come to a place of repentance and, and, and f lead people to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That's our only hope, church. Starting in verse 
44, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instruct, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling. David asked who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. So intentionally, or the tabernacle was beautiful. Oh, let me finish there. It says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? The tabernacle was beautiful. It was expensive. It was built to the exact specifications, the exact pattern that God instructed Moses to build it. It was God's tent in the midst of his people. It's where they met with God. It's where God's presence dwelt for them. Stephen's point was that after all, it was never meant to be a permanent structure. It was always a tempor temporary structure. It was always, they put it, they would move it from place to place. Whenever, wherever they moved, they brought the tabernacle with them. It was never meant to be permanent. It was always to be, be replaced by something better. And they couldn't deny it. Look again, he's saying. When you look again, you see it was never permanent. It was always pointing to something better, a better tabernacle. What is that tabernacle? Well, it's, it's us. It's us. We are the tabernacle. We are the temple of God where God's presence resides. Isn't that better? It's better. And what is Pete, Stephen experiencing? He's experiencing better. And he's trying to let them experience better. If you would open your eyes, you will see that there is better. You're defending something that is obsolete. You, and if you would open your eyes and see, you can have what I have. You can, you can have the presence of God dwelling in you. So intentionally or unintentionally, they confined God to a temple. Whether they were conscious of it or not, they, defined, they confined God to a temple. Stephen was confronting the idolatry of the temple. God is too big to be confined to a single place, to a temple. It's just obvious, isn't it? Of course. I mean, he's God. He, this, the earth is his footstool. He created everything in it. Why would we think that we could confine God to a place made with human hands? A little, you know, what, it's stupid. If you think about it, right? It's stupid. <laughs> Don't be stupid, he's saying. He's trying to shake the scales from their eyes. He, he's using the same scriptures that they've always known, except they're blinded. They can't see it. If the scales would fall from their eyes and, and they could see clearly what God is trying to speak to them, that there was never part of the that was never intended to be permanent, that what Stephen's experiencing is available to all of them. And that's what we do, isn't it? When we share the gospel with somebody, we're trying to shake the scales from their eyes. If you would only see what I see, you could have what I have. Pretty obvious to us. I don't think anyone here would confine God to, or confine the work of God to this building. Is this where God is? Sure, because you're here. Is this the only place God is? No, that's silly, right? We don't confine God to a building. No, we confine his work to a calendar. Because I know there are a lot of Christians who would never confine God's work to a building, but the only time they worship God is Sunday. The only time they pray to God is Sunday mornings. The only time they crack open a Bible and read the Word of God is, is Sunday mornings. The only time they talk to anybody about God is Sunday mornings. So mine as well just confined to the building. If this is the only place you think about God and then the rest of the other six days you don't give God a thought, you don't live for God, he might as well be confined to a building. Sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? It sounds just as silly as the life these religious leaders were leaving, confining God to a place. It's not that confining the work, you're not confining, you're confining him to a building. You're confining him to a day. You know, you're not confining him to a building, you're confining him to a day. 
this is the only place you pray, talk about him, open the Bible. He may as well only live in this building. Listen, it's good that you come to church. I'm glad you come to church on Sundays, you know, if this is speaking to you. But if you think this is good, if you think this is good, oh, I love it. I love the worship. I'm so glad we have the drums. I, I, I like sometimes I like your message, Pastor Jim. I enjoy church on Sundays. If you think this is good, try living for Jesus every day. Try seeking him every day. Open your eyes every day to seek him through the word, through prayer, through studying your own Bible, through talking to others about him. Guess what? It's so much better if we would open our eyes and see that life outside of this building could be so much better. If church, if God is only somebody you come and worship on Sundays and talk about on Sundays, you're missing out on so much. Don't confine him to one day. And he goes, 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of the angels and have not kept it. What happened to Stephen? What's it gotten into him? He was doing so well. He remained calm. He's delivering this wonderful explanation, showing them the scriptures and their errors in their ways. Why, why this sudden outburst of anger? You stiff-necked. I don't know what that would translate into today. I wouldn't probably call you stiff-necked. I might have other words. You stiff-necked people. It's definitely an insult. I, can, I know that. Why this sudden outburst? Well, you could only imagine as Stephen is giving this explanation that he's looking at their faces and he could see their anger building up. He could see their impatience. They, they, he knew the sermon was over. He knew they were going to cut him off at any time. So before he could even finish this sudden outburst and you stiff, you're not listening, he knew that they were rejecting Jesus again. He saw it in their faces. You know, I stand up here every week. Guess what I can see? Your faces. Every one of you. I know when you disagree with me, I can see it in your faces. <laughs> I know when the Holy Spirit touches you and convicts your heart, I can see it in your faces. I know when you're bored, I can see it in your faces. I knew the sermon was over last week when I looked at all of you and you said, yeah, the sermon's over. They're all falling asleep. You laugh because you know it's true. <laughs> But mostly, Stephen knew they were rejecting Jesus again. The issue, Stephen says, isn't reviling the temple. The issue is resisting the Holy Spirit. And that's what they were doing. The Holy Spirit was working in them through Stephen. We're a conduit of the Holy Spirit. When we deliver the word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we are a conduit of the Holy Spirit to reach into the lost, the sinner's soul. And they're resisting the Holy Spirit. You know, they're resisting the word of God and the spirit is trying to talk to them. The issue wasn't slighting Moses. They slain the prophets, even the Messiah himself. The issue wasn't blaspheming the law. Stephen said the issue is you're breaking the law. You guys are breaking the law. Moses told you to look for another one that would come that's greater than him. That was Jesus. Open your eyes and see. Open your eyes and see, he's saying. Open your ears and hear. If you would just open your eyes, if you would just open your ears, you would see the glory of God. But they're just, they're following, they were true to their history. They were true to their history. Look at, this is just a few examples uh, we see of, of their history of rejecting God. Jeremiah 6.10, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them, and they have no delight in it. Listen, they're not only rejecting the word of God, they're, it's a reproach to them. Now that Stephen has opened their eyes, or the Holy Spirit is ministering to them, instead of receiving it, instead of having ears to hear, it has become a reproach to them. They're, it's disgusting them because they're, God is showing them that they're what wrong. He's, cl he's clearly showing them. Listen, they couldn't even argue with Stephen. They couldn't argue with the wisdom of Stephen. So instead of, re instead, of, instead of 
confessing their sins instead of repenting. Thank you. Instead of repenting, it has become a reproach to them. Ezekiel 12, 2. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who has eyes to see but does not see, refuses to see, and ears to hear but refuses to hear. For they are what? Rebellious. They are rebellious. It's not ignorant. They can't plead ignorance. It's rebellion, willful rebellion against God. They're refusing to hear, refusing to see. Zechariah 7, 11. But they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, stopped their ears so they could not hear. What are they going to do in just a moment? They're going to close their ears and as they charge after Stephen. It's a willful refusal. Matthew, look what Jesus says in Matthew 13. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. It's a willful refusal. The heart of man, if, 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 if man's heart would just be inclined to see God, he will reveal himself. But if we refuse... It's a willful refusal. It says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They grinded their teeth at him. That's anger. They were angry. The message had an effect, didn't it? It had an effect, just not the desired effect that Stephen wanted. It hit home, but instead of repenting, they became furious. They gnashed their teeth and at anger. At Stephen in anger. But Jesus tells us, tells us of another gnashing at teeth, doesn't he? When we reject God, when we rebel against God, when we refuse to open our eyes to see God, there's another gnashing of teeth that takes place. We see it here in Matthew 13. So it will be at the end for those who reject God, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from amongst the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's a different gnashing of teeth, isn't there? That's not a gnashing out in anger. That's a gnashing of pain, of, of suffering, of being in the furnace of fire. Jesus said to them, have you understood these things? Talking to the disciples, they said to him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Those who refuse to see and hear will spend eternity in darkness gnash and gnashing of teeth. The disciples really didn't understand either at this point. But they had a heart to understand. They wanted to understand. And eventually they would be able to see, just like Stephen sees. Eventually they would click because their heart was open to see. They, they had an understanding, but they really didn't understand who Jesus was at that point when he said that. You know, what can we see when we open our eyes? Some amazing things, can't we? What can we see? It says, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing, right at, standing at the right hand of God. He opened his eyes, he looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus, he saw the glory of God. That's pretty amazing. I would rather open my eyes and see Jesus than have and close my eyes and end up gnashing my teeth in the furnace of fire. First, he saw Jesus. I can't explain how he saw Jesus. Did a window open up in heaven and you could peek up and see Jesus standing there at the right hand of God? You know, was it a vision? Was it in his spirit? I don't know. But he saw Jesus. His eyes were open to see Jesus. They weren't on the circumstances. They weren't on his enemies. They weren't on the accusers. There was no fear in his eyes. His eyes were open to see something incredible. He saw Jesus. What do we tend to do when we look at our circumstances? Well, Jesus is up there. Jesus, if we're looking for Jesus, we'll see him. 
our hearts, if our hearts are looking for Jesus in the midst of our circumstances, when the when the granddaughter's in the hospital, we're looking for Jesus. We're not looking at the circumstances. Guess what? God will show us Jesus and we'll have an amazing testimony to come because Jesus is always there. But we can't see him when we take our when we stop looking for him and we begin to look at our enemies, look at our circumstances, look at all the distractions around us. We're not going to see Jesus. Until we take our eyes off of those things, like Stephen did, look up into heaven and God will show himself. Jesus, listen, to be, if to be spiritually blind is to not see Jesus, to have spiritual sight is to see Jesus, no matter the circumstance. The first men's retreat I ever went on a long time ago, heard a testimony from a guy. It was like three sessions Friday night session, two Saturday sessions, and for the first two and a half sessions, man, it was hard because this, this guy lost his family, his wife and his children, in a bus accident, uh, maybe it was a church van, and it was, you know, they were on a church event, a church youth retreat or something, and everybody died. They all died. His family, all the kids, you know, it was, several, it was a lot of kids, and the adults, the chaperones, and his wife was a chaperone. And man, it tore him up, obviously, right? And, you know, he's looking for Jesus in it the whole time. He's looking for Jesus. However, he's in so much pain, so much grief, he just couldn't get past it. He could not, he could not get past the grief, and he could not move on with his life, having lost his young children and his wife. And he got to a point where he got, went into his bedroom, and that was it. I can't live like this anymore. And I believe he took out a gun. And as he's getting ready to end his life, Jesus showed up, literally. He had a Stephen moment where God opened a window to heaven and showed him his wife, his children, standing with Jesus. He never stopped looking for Jesus. He questioned Jesus. He was angry. He was angry with God. He, he, he went through all, but he never stopped looking for Jesus in the midst of the situation. He never gave up his faith. And right when he needed Jesus the most, he showed him, I mean, he gave him a glimpse into heaven. See, God is faithful all of our lives. He is faithful. He never took his eye. He never stopped looking. And just God, he was always there. He was always there. And he showed up just when he needed him the most. He went on. He went on to, to be healed from that grief. He ended up marrying another woman who lost her husband and children in the same accident. They had, God restored their family. Every family. He's, go. Man this, was, man, this was probably 30 years ago, and I still remember it. I don't remember all the details. Went on to minister, you know, for the glory of God. Jesus was always there. He just couldn't see him, but God's faithful. He showed, him out. he showed himself when all else failed. You know, story, Stephen's story doesn't end quite the same way because Stephen dies. <laughs> we don't, you know, he's a, he, if, I hope you know the story, but, but Stephen dies at the end. But the second thing he saw before he died was Jesus standing. Whew. All the other accounts of Jesus after the ascension, we see him seated, right? Seated at the right hand of God it signifies authority honor, position. That's who Jesus is. However, in Stephen's vision, he's standing at the right hand of God. That's a powerful moment. Jesus stood up for Stephen. <laughs> Jesus stood up for Stephen. What does that tell us? What is that saying to us? Man, we, I don't know exactly. It's believed he stood to welcome and receive Stephen to receive him at the moment of his trial, of his martyrdom. Stephen, I see you, Stephen. I see you, Stephen. I'm standing up for you. I'm honoring with your sacrifice. Showing Stephen that he was actively present. Hey, I'm here. I'm here, Stephen. I'm, I'm, I'm attentive. I see what they're doing, Stephen. I see what's going on, Stephen. I'm not oblivious, and, and, and I'm ready to receive you into my presence, Stephen. Why didn't Jesus stop the crowd from stoning Stephen? If he's active, if he's, if he's attentive, if he sees what's going on, why didn't he just stop him? Who would vote to, be for the, to, to have the, Jesus stop the stones? 
we would all just stop the stone. Don't let him do this. I have my whole life ahead of me. I have family. I have things to do. I have a business to run. I have people that depend on me. Jesus, stop them from doing this. I'm, you know I'm right. You know I, I, they're killing me for preaching the gospel. Jesus, why don't you stop this? <laughs> That's what we would say, would it, isn't it? Listen, if you looked up, and saw Jesus standing up at the right hand of God, would you want to stay here? (laughs) It's all about perspective, isn't it? If you open your eyes and you truly see Jesus, you don't want to stay here. Look at 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him, And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. John Corson says this, The contrast is great between the uptightness, anger, and bitterness of the crowd and the peace and tranquility of Stephen, who had the face of an angel. While these men were frenzied, Stephen was totally at peace. Why? Because while the crowd looked down on Stephen, Stephen looked up to heaven. While the crowd looked down on Stephen, Stephen looked up at heaven. I was in the prison Wednesday talking to a guy, an older gentleman who's a believer. He's growing in the Lord. He's you know, relatively new in his faith. And um, he was sharing how he's struggling with the guards. You know, they're looking down on him, the way they're treating him. They're not you know, treat, just treating him horribly, which, you know, that. It happens a lot there. You put a uniform on somebody, give them a little authority over somebody, and they, and they just don't treat them well. And, and he's just struggling with that in, in his Christianity. I said, you're looking through the wrong lenses. You're looking through your eyes. You're, you're looking through your spiritual blindness. Open your eyes to see as Jesus sees them, as Stephen saw them, right? Listen, you're holding this anger and bitterness and resentment towards these people who are looking down on you and treating you well. I said, when you can see them with spiritual eyesight, well, you won't see, you won't hold bitterness towards them. You'll see them as Jesus sees them. And, and then, see, you're holding God back from working on your behalf because you're receiving the fruits of your labor, you're, you're holding bitterness, so God can't move in that. But if you release that, and then you turn them over to the hands of God. And, and listen, you're a child of God. So when you turn somebody over to God, well, then you pray for them. Then you pray for them. Pray for the, your enemies. Pray for them who abuse you and spitefully use you because now you're turning them over to the hand of God, and you don't want the wrath of God on anybody. You, see, you have a different perspective. You say, and you pray for them, and God's either going to change their heart towards you and towards himself, or they're in trouble, or there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're going to lose their job, for one. They're going to lose their position of authority over you because God's going to look after you because that's who you are, and he's going to, and the wrath of God will be on them, and you don't want that. You don't wish that on anybody. When you see through God's eyes, you don't wish his wrath on anybody. Does that make sense? You're a child of God. He looks after his children. But you're holding back God from ministering because you're holding resentment and bitterness and even hatred in your heart towards somebody. God can't work through that. He's not going to bless your bitterness. And that's what God did here. This is Paul, who was bitter. We're going to see that he breathed out murderous threats. But this had an impact on Paul, who would later become the great apostle Paul, right? The one that wrote half most of the New Testament, the one that ministers so greatly. God allowed Stephen to die because as a result, we get the apostle Paul. I don't know that Stephen was going to write all those books, you know, all those letters. God always knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Verse 59 says, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Sound familiar? Who did did Stephen see? He saw Jesus. What did Jesus say? Father, receive my spirit. I'm ready to go. Stephen was ready to go. 
when you have your eyes, when you have eyes to see Jesus, you're ready to go. You're ready to go. This world has no longer has a hold on you. When you see Jesus, there's nothing in this world, no earthly attachment that has a hold on you. And you have a different perspective. Then they knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. How could Stephen be so peaceful, dying, without fighting back, without lashing out, crying, Lord, do not charge them with this sin? He looked into heaven and he saw Jesus. We're told in Revelation 6, 5, or maybe it's 5, 6, that when we see him, we'll see him as a lamb that had been slain. We'll see him as a lamb that had been slain. We'll see the, the scars in his hands, the scars in his feet and his side, right? We'll see him as a lamb that was slain. Therefore, if I'm looking up to heaven and seeing my Lord, I'm going to understand that those scars, those scars are there because of my sin. My rebellion, my depravity caused him to be crucified on Calvary. Nobody else's sin. My sin caused those scars. As I look into heaven and see what my sin did, I'll stop looking at what others are doing to me. I say, Lord Jesus, forgive them. Don't hold this against them. When we see Jesus, we have no other choice but to be amazed at his grace towards us and to be at peace with others. It's when we take our eyes off of Jesus that we become defensive, antagonistic, abrasive, combative, callous, critical. Jesus was none of those, was he? Why is the church? What about you? Who's bothering you? Who's keeping you up at night, worried, bitter against, resentful against? Maybe it's not somebody you know. Maybe it's somebody, you know, you look at our world leaders. You look at the leaders of our own country, and you get worried, and it keeps you up at night. What are they doing to our nation? Look what you're doing to our country. Look what you're doing to our world. And, 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 you, and you're, you're up at night worrying and, and bitter and angry at what, what they're doing, what they're, what's happening in our world, because we know, we know where it's leading, right? The solution's simple. Don't look down on people in their ignorance, in their rebellion, in their stupidity. Look up to heaven and see the Lord. Look up. See how he's forgiven you. See the grace he's shown you, the mercy he's extended to you. Listen, in the Gospels, we see the disciples always ready to fight, don't we? Always ready to fight. James and John ready to call down fire from heaven to, 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 to you know, burn up the, the town of the Samaritan village, the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter pulls out his sword, cuts off the uh, high priest servant's ear. You know, always ready for a fight. The triumphal entry. Now there's thousands and thousands of them ready. They're not, they're ready to go in and fight to take back Jerusalem from, from the Roman control. They're ready for a fight all through the gospels. They're, they're ready for a fight. They could only see Jesus as the conquering king. They couldn't see him as the suffering servant. They couldn't see him as the lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. It wasn't until they saw him again, until they saw the scale, the, the nail scar, the scar, his nail scarred hands, his nail scarred feet, that they said, "Truly, this is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins." Their eyes weren't opened, despite the fact that Jesus consistently taught them to seek peace, to love their enemies, and to turn the other cheek, didn't he? It wasn't until they saw the scars and it took all the fight out of them. It took all the fight out of them. We do not see them. Prove me wrong, but I don't think you can. After they saw Jesus, 
and they saw the scars, they realized that, that it was their sin that put Jesus on the cross. We don't see them fighting anymore. The only thing we see them fighting for, the only thing we see them fighting for is what God appointed them to. They sought peace, they, sought, they prayed for their enemies, and they, they preached the gospel. They preached the gospel. When we see, when the church opens its eyes to, and looks at Jesus, guess what? We're not going to be fighting, holding on to hold on to the things of this world any longer. We're not going to be fighting to hold on to the attachments of this world any longer. Listen, we have been called to fight for the kingdom of God in the kingdom of earth. Listen, this isn't our battle. The battle, this, that, this is the Lord's battle. He will take care of the things of the world. Our job is to take care of the things of the kingdom, to pursue the things of the kingdom, to preach the thing. What did Jesus preach? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. When we, the church, see Jesus, we'll stop fighting the things of the world. Amen. And God will give us the grace to do it. You know, I was, it came to me last service. I, there's, times, there's times I'll be ministering to somebody who has been abused by a child. And, or be sexually abused as a child. And, and I see firsthand the, the ra- would, how it's ravaged their life. I mean, it's horrible. It's horrible what that does to a person. And it lasts for, for years and years and years, the effects of that. And trying to minister healing to that is so hard. And then the next day, I might be ministering to somebody who has done that to a child. How do you do that? How do you do that? There was a time I couldn't do that. I absolutely could not do that. One day I'm ministering to somebody who has been affected by child abuse. The next day I'm ministering to somebody, trying to minister life to somebody who has caused that pain. Only by the grace of God, the empowering of God, being able to not look down on the person, but to look up to heaven and see him as Jesus sees him. Can I minister life to that person? It took a while, church. It took a long time. God, God had blinders on me for so long. I've been in prison ministry for a couple decades now. He had to put blinders on me because I wasn't ready for that. But thankfully, by his grace, I can, I can do that now. I could do that now and, and, and minister, try to minister life. We can do that. You might be saying, Pastor Jim, I just can't do that. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Look to Jesus, that he will open your eyes. Open my eyes, Lord, to see like you see. You might just get to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Amen. There's no telling. There's no limit to what God will show you when you're looking for him, looking at him. Amen. Oh, praise God. Maybe you've come here this morning and your eyes haven't been open to see Jesus. And, and my question is to you. If you reject Jesus this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus. If you reject Jesus this morning, what is God going to turn you over to? I promise you it's not going to be good. I promise you it ends in destruction. It ends in weeping and gnashing of teeth in the, in the life to come. But it, ends to, it, it will lead you to a place of misery in this life. You know, like, But I'm doing okay right now without God. Guess what? It's not over yet. I know God has shown, I know where my life would be today had I rejected him 30 years ago. It would not be, I would not be in a good place. If God has tugged on your heart this morning and you don't know Jesus, we just want to give you an opportunity. That tugging, that's the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. He loves you. He just wants to re- you to receive him into your life. And he promises to show him that he will be there. He will show you all that he is as you per- continue to pursue and to seek him. But you need to be bold and, s- and confess with your mouth and say, yes, you are the son of God. And confess him as Lord and he will come into your life, come into your heart just as he did for Stephen. But we would ask, listen, we would like to say a prayer with you. If God has spoken to your heart today, receiving Jesus, we'll all say it with you. But we'd ask you to be bold and raise your hand and say, yes, Pastor Jim, I want to say that prayer. Anybody this morning? Okay, I don't see any hands. I'm going to trust that we've all done that. I believe that we've all done that. Amen. Well, church, we all have blinders in some area, don't we? 
that we want removed. I told you I had blinders for years on different things. Let's pray that God would open our eyes completely to see Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your word today, for the the life of Stephen, the death of Stephen. Lord, we have a brief you know, glimpse into his life, but how powerful it is to see a life zealous, sold out for you, a life that desires nothing but to please you. Lord, in any other case, it would be a sad story of this, this man pouring out his heart and then being stoned to death. But thank you for allowing us to see him see you. Hallelujah. That our hearts might turn to you, that we would desire to see you more clearly, that our eyes would be open at anything that's causing blindness on us seeing you, Lord, any distractions that we might have from this world, any attachments to this world that's blinding us from seeing you, from being effective for you, that you would reveal them to us that, and take them out of the way. Lord, we, we pray your grace and your strength to help us to be, to be able to minister like Stephen ministered, to see, to love others so much that even when they throw, pick up rocks to throw at us, we would pray for them, that we'd be able to pray for our enemies, forgive them and as you forgave us, that we would see clearly that it was my sin that put you on that cross and that you forgave me so that we would forgive, be able to forgive others, to look on them as the one that you love, be effective in this part. We're, we're accountable we're accountable for what we do in this life. As an individual, as a church, as the body of Christ, what are we leaving the next generation? We, we don't want them speaking Chinese, Lord. We want them to be speaking the things of God, learning the oracles of God, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we would come to a place of repentance, a place of revival. Let it begin here in this church, Lord, with us as each individual. We'd be broken before you. Lord, the world needs you. Our country needs you. Dagsboro needs you. Sussex County needs you like never before. We Let it begin here. Let it begin with this church, Lord, that we would come to a place of just op- eyes wide open to all that you have for us. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon each one here. And until we come back again, Lord, continue to minister to us, Lord, that we serve you all the days of our week of our life, Lord. We wouldn't just come here looking to be filled up to meet you here. We would seek you out every day. Plant that desire in our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Glory to God.